Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Bouchard Vasselin North America and La Motabie webinar. Today, we are going to talk about cider making and mainly about five common challenges we are meeting when we make cider. So we are having two speakers today, um, Mark Chick and myself. Mark, do you want to introduce yourself? Thank you, Aglantin. Uh, my name is Mark Chick. I'm the North American product manager for Bucru Unipactin process equipment. Uh, we offer everything from reception equipment, including mills and scrubbers to pressing, filtration, and other process equipment. Our goal is to make, give you the ability to make the highest quality, lowest solids juice that uh, the industry provides. Eglantine. Thank you, Mark. So, so myself, Eglantine Chauffour, I'm the wine making and cider making product manager for Boucher Basel North America. And so let me introduce you really fast the um, two partners for this webinar today. We have La Motabie, which is a renowned enological product brand. It has been developed in Bordeaux, founded in 1878, so 140 years of expertise and consulting. Today, we are going to focus mainly on what is applicable on cider making. And Boucherini Pectin, Mark, do you want to introduce Boucherini Pectin? Yes, Bucher uh, was originally founded in 1807 uh, as a machine shop in Native Endic in Switzerland. We started making Apple process equipment in 1897. So we've been doing this for quite a while, have quite a bit of experience. Our first hydraulic presses were developed in 1967. Uh, since then, we've made many advances in process equipment, including our mills, presses, filtration, evaporation. Uh, our, again, our goal is to give you the tools to make the best cider and juice possible. Eglantine? Thank you. So this presentation is going to be half an hour presentation. We are going to talk about how to increase juice yield, how to improve filtration and settling how to limit uh, the production of H2S and other reductive compounds, controlling and designing aromatic profile and management of microbes. After the presentation, we will have a 10 minutes question and answer portion where Mark and me will be available to answer any question you have. If you have any connectivity issue, go on support.zoom.us and you will find um, all the help you need. So now let's start. I'm going to let Mark give you some tips and solutions on how to increase juice yield while optimizing quality. Thank you, Glantine. Uh, next slide will show the Bucher mill process. Uh, our smallest mill, which is the C25, is designed to process up to 20 tons per hour of apples. Uh, this seems like a lot, but I, as we explain more about pressing, uh, you'll understand that volume. But it is designed to be simple to use, hygienic, easy to clean. We can size the grind depending on the product, whether it's pears or apples. We can also do carrots, uh, beets, other harder fruits and vegetables. It is designed so that the pressing process after the mill uh, has a proper size and form mash to maximize your yield and quality while keeping the solids uh, below one and a half percent. We can combine this with what we call a complete unit, uh, which is called an aggregate, which includes the mill, a tank, the pump, and controls all in one convenient, almost plug and play unit. You just need to provide a hopper for the apples delivered into the mill and the, a mash line out and electricity and it's a ready to go unit. It is fully CIP able, compatible with all common cleaning agents, uh, including caustics, peroxides, uh, it's fully stainless steel. And again, this is designed to, to maximize your yield and quality uh, for all your downstream process. Next slide. So, so this mill will prepare you for your, your pressing steps. From the mill, we would go to pressing, from pressing to settling to your filtration system. So the, the mill is to allow the press to give you the, the optimum results for making the best juice, which makes the best cider. 
Okay, Glentine, I think uh, the next step is uh, we're gonna hand off to you. So from the mill, we go into the press. The, the Bucher press is an axial fed. It's a, a continuous batch press system that allows the press to be filled and it presses while, while filling. It alternates between filling and pressing and filling and pressing for about 50 to 60% of the pressing cycle. Once the filling is done during pre-pressing, it goes into the pressing cycle. Our patented drain cores allow the mash to stay inside the press while the juice flows through the filter socks along the, that splined core to the discharge. This system with a great surface area of the socks allows for very good yields, very fast throughput, and yet very low solids because we have very low maceration. The, the product isn't aggressively tumbled, but it's tumbled enough to expose unprocessed fruit to the drainage cores. So this allows us a very high quality fruit. The press will then, at the end of pressing cycle, will automatically turn on the pumice discharge conveying system, dump itself. When it's completed dumping, it will close the shell and begin the cycle all over again. Our controls will design, are designed not only to operate the press, but to operate your pumice removal system, your mash infeed system, so the press can run the, your entire system. Uh, we have systems with up to 18 presses running with a single operator. Uh, so the technology is very high, it's, it's robust, simple to operate, and very effective in pro providing the highest quality, highest yield juice available on the market today. Some of the fruits we handle, obviously our apples are about 90% of our business, but we also do a, a really high uh, percentage in pears, grapes, cherries, strawberries, blackberries, currants, kiwis, as I discussed earlier, carrots, we do stevia tea, we do Nepali cactus. So this is not just a single use machine, it's, it's got a wide range of, of process capabilities, uh, giving you more flexibility in what you can add to your product line. It's all self-optimized depending on the, what product you're running. Uh, it carries up to 50 profiles, so you can have different uh, recipes for apples, pears, different kinds of apples, uh, other fruits, other vegetables, depending on what your process. So it's very simple to operate. Uh, the interface is very user-friendly, gives a lot of information so that you can see where your process is at any given time. This is very important for high quality production. All of our equipment is designed for large use. We're, we're designed to, to run up to 20 hours a day, seven days a week, 360 days a year. Obviously not everybody runs at that kind of rates, uh, but that is the robust nature of this machinery. We have machinery that built in 1970, still operating today with original controls. Uh, for those machines, we still offer updates. But uh, nonetheless, uh, it is a very robust machine designed for years and years and years of, of high quality, reliable operation. I think I will let uh, Egontine talk about uh, improved filtration settling requirements before we get into that stage. Thank you, Mark. Um, so challenge number two is, um, as Mark just said, uh, improving filtration and settling. So the first step that we are thinking about is depectinization. So pectin is actually a complex polysaccharide, as you can see on the image here with many ramifications. It's present in a lot of fruit and veggies, plants. It's responsible for forming uh, a gel or like maintaining the solution as it is. Orange peel, queen, pear, and apple are the richest in pectin. Actually, uh, the production of pectin is made out of dried citrus peel and apple pomace. The concentration and the type of pectin will vary with the, different, with the apple varieties and also harvest time and storage. So, but in any case, to improve settling, clarification, and filtration yield, we are going to need to cut this chain with enzymes that are called pectinase. It happens that the family of uh, pectinase includes a lot of activities such as pectin lyase, pe polygalacturonase, pectin methylesterase, which are all uh, needed 
to break down the chain of pectin. Then, um, so it's important to use a pectinase that does as all the essential activities without negative activities. Some enzymes that are not purified can have some activities such as cinnamylesterase that produce volatile phenol precursors. So be careful with the enzyme you use. You want all the pectinase activity, but you still want to purify the enzyme. So using pectinase will increase the milling and pressing performance. We'll also increase aromatic compound extraction because you lose the cell walls of the, of the plant. So you are helping the molecules to be extracted and you increase settling and filtration yield. Lamotabi has a range of pectinase that are very efficient and purified enzymes. So I'm more than happy to give you some uh, recommendation on enzyme after the presentation. Then before you go for filtration, it is a good idea to actually test uh, for pectin. So there is an easy and quick test to do to understand if you need more enzyme, more time, higher temperature, or if you are good to go. Here's a test. So basically you are mixing acidified ethanol with filtered juice. You wait 15 minutes. If your test, if your juice is clear like this, you are good to go. You have negative for pectin. If you do have some haze or you are forming a precipitate, it means you still have pectin. It is a good idea to add more enzyme or to wait longer or to increase the temperature to make the enzyme works better before going to filtration. And I'm gonna mark it's your turn now. <laughs> Thank you, Glentine. Yeah, as Eglantine uh, discussed, uh, getting rid of pectins is very important in the filtration step because pectins uh, form a gelatinous surface inside the crossflow filtration system, so it's not a good thing to do. Uh, we provide a, a wide range of filters uh, for this con this conversation. We're mostly talking about the Mini Star, which is rated at 600 to 2300 gallons per hour in. Uh, it's a compact unit. It's a, again, a plug and play system. Uh, it's ready to go. It's fully self-contained. It's got the retentate tank. It's got the pumps, controls, filter modules, all in one compact uh, manageable skid. The touchscreen controls are, as in the press, very simple to operate. Uh, this is a, again, a fully self-contained unit. They're again designed just like the rest of the equipment to run up to 20 hours a day, followed by a, your daily CIP process as with any cross filtration. And we offer a range of filter media. Our most common is the KMS Supercore membranes, but we also offer uh, cartridges by Memos, which is a European supplier, makes high, high quality uh, filter media, Polysulfone media is similar to the KMS, uh, but some slightly different properties. And it also has a stainless steel cartridge instead of the poly cartridge as in the KMS units. However, the, the KMS is probably 75 to 80% of what we sell is the K with the Supercork KMS cartridges. Uh, this, is, this will give you your ready to go product coming out the back end. Uh, sterile, ready to go into your cider process. And I think from here, we get more into the discussion with Eglantine, and she will now talk to you about uh, reducing hydrogen sulfide and other reductive compounds. Thank you, Mark. So um, this uh, next uh, topic is actually, um, it's definitely one of the most common one. H2S and reductive aromas are associated to off flavors such as rotten egg, burnt tire, skunk, burnt matches, onion, garlic, cabbage, all these nice aromas that are pretty common in cider. So these compounds, so here you have some um, chemical molecules. I um, 
usually ask what's the common point between all these molecules, but as a webinar, it becomes complicated to interact. So the common point to all these molecules is actually the sulfur compound that you can see is present in each of these molecules. This sulfur atom is coming from SO2, molecular sulfur that you could use on apple treatment, but also uh, sulfur amino acids that are naturally present in the juice. The first molecule that is formed and then become transformed into mercaptan or disulfides or other reductive compounds is H2S. So that's gonna be our focus. And H2S is gonna be reacting with other cider compounds, lees and oxygen to produce all these other molecules. H2S is so the origin of the, most of the reductive compounds. And also it is mostly produced by the yeast during fermentation when the yeast is stressed. So here you have a very um, summarized um, little drawing of what's happening in the yeast and how she's producing H2S. So basically yeast is gonna assimilate sulfur, so SO2, molecular sulfur, she's gonna assimilate it and use a, a nitrogen pool to produce sulfur amino acids, as you can see here. Sulfur amino acids are needed, are needed for the yeast as any other amino acids to produce protein and to just survive and ferment. As soon as you don't have nitrogen anymore, if this nitrogen pool is completely uh, empty, the sulfur has nowhere to go. Basically, we can't produce sulfur amino acid anymore and the yeast is gonna reject it as H2S. So basically, to limit H2S production or other uh, sulfur compounds, we want to make sure there is enough nitrogen for the yeast and we want to make sure the yeast is healthy enough and the membrane is fluid and resistant to keep assimilating nitrogen when there is nitrogen. So basically, the solution to, um, to limit H2S production are gonna be the first one is the yeast selection. Some yeast are more prompt than some other to produce H2S, but also manage yeast stress and nutrition. So the first step is you want to measure your YAN, your yeast assimilable nitrogen, to know your starting point, to know if you are starting deficient or not, and to understand how um, big is the problem or how risky is the situation. Apple tends to have very low YAN, especially when it's later in the season and after cold storage, which actually explain why uh, this issue is one of the most common ones. So you want to limit the stress of the yeast as well. As soon as yeast is stressed, uh, she is spending time surviving and not assimilating nutrients. So this will induce a lack of nitrogen and a rejection of, of aromas, which um, as a little picture, it um, could be a little bit as um, us if, or as you when you um, are stressed, you usually reject of aromas and not really positive aromas. But anyway, making sure the yeast is healthy with a fluid membrane is very important. And for this, we have anosteam, which is um, sterile fatty acids, yeast derivates, and also vitamin and minerals that will help the yeast being healthy. As you can see on the draw here, on the graph here, um, using anosteam at the beginning, at the rehydration or at the beginning of the fermentation can reduce considerably the amount of H2S and other um, mercaptans that can be produced by the yeast. Second step, have a balanced uh, nitrogen diet. So yeast can assimilate ammonia and amino acids. They don't have the same nutritional value. As you can imagine with the picture here, amino acids are the healthy food. Yeast can actually store it in the vacuum and use it as they need, but she can use it directly since they are the building blocks of the protein but since it is a big molecule it requires special transport and it requires energy so the yeast needs amino acid but the yeast assimilate it only when she is comfortable in the environment which means at the beginning of fermentation ammonia ammonia is an easy food to assimilate it's a junk food for the yeast it's um easy to assimilate because it can go by diffusion, by gradient diffusion. There's no need of energy or special transport. 
but then the yeast cannot store it. So the yeast is taking it, using it, which usually create like spike of population heat. And if the yeast cannot use it anymore, she is gonna reject it in urea. And also it can induce a deficit in nitrogen since you build too much population. So the ammonia is kind of the, the coulée of the kids. I'd say it makes the yeast very, very excited for a little moment of time, but then it's not a long-term uh, and balanced food. Then the other options is to aerate the ferment. So when you use oxygen, yeast needs oxygen to have a healthy membrane, but also yeast can, um, also the oxygen and the aeration can blow off some H2S that has been produced. And then after fermentation, we are talking about managing the lees. If your lees stink, don't leave your cider on the lees because you will extract only negative aromas. So I just want to focus a little bit more on this balanced diet um, story. And so basically to let you know that yeast needs everything as we do, there is just an order. So first you want to give the amino acids and you want to help the yeast building like healthy membrane that are fluid. So we are talking about using anosteam at the rehydration that will protect the yeast, build a strong and resistant yeast, and give also all the amino acids the yeast needs and can store in the vacuole. At a third of fermentation, that's when we want to use OptiFerm, which is a blend of ammonia, survival factors, and yeast derivative that acts as detox detoxification. Um, and in this case, you can use oxygen as well in the same time. So with these two applications, you should actually have a very balanced diet that will um, help you reducing a lot the production of H2S. So the next uh, challenge that we are talking about is to design aromatic profile. So um, we are kind of staying in the same topic because this is very related to yeast and yeast nutrition, they play an important role on aromatic profile and complexity, but they are not the only parameters. So obviously the first one is a varietal precursors. Each apple is different, each apple variety has its own characteristic and their own aromatic precursors. So we want to optimize the extraction of these precursors by using the proper miller, the proper press, and also enzymes to extract. Second step is the yeast. The yeast choice is going to impact a lot the aromatic uh, characteristic. You have different enzymatic activities in the yeast. It's a genetic parameter, um, which basically is going to say if the yeast produce and express more or less aromatic compound and which one. La Motabie did a lot of work on breeding, yeast breeding and selection based on their genetics. So we control completely um, we know which genes are uh, highly expressed and we can have yeast that are really focused on some aromatic expressions. Next step is the yeast nutrition. So we already saw how Unos team can help yeast producing clean aromas and reducing the off flavor, um, of sulfur flavor aromas, but also Unos team is gonna bring some fatty acids that are precursors of esters, as you can see in the graph below your screen, when you have, when you add some um, fatty acids in the environment, yeast is actually producing the relative ester, esters, uh, which express much more aromas. La Motabie developed some um, nutrients that are focused on um, different amino acid selection that will help you optimize the expression of aromas. So we have optiesters, that is a selection of amino acids that act as precursors of ester and acetate. So as you can see in the graph here, we can easily increase of 44% in this case, but a good like 40 to 50% the production of esters after fermentation. And then we have optitiol, which is an increase of thiolic compounds. So we are talking about tropical, guava, patient fruit, grapefruit type of aromas. And same uh, thing, when you use optitiol, you can use, increase up to 50, a little bit more uh, percent, the amount of this compound. So to summarize on the aromatic profile, so sorry, one last point is obviously to add aromas and you can use oak 
chips, which we have a range of oak chips, but also a lot of other flavors that uh, you probably are more familiar than I am with this. So to summarize it, if you want to produce um, a cider that is more estery, so peach, strawberry, raspberry, pear, apple, banana, we want to ferment low temperature with excellent STR as a yeast, an steam at the rehydration and opti ester at the inoculation. If you want more uh, fresh, fruity, tropical, um, grapefruit type of aromas, you want to ferment higher with excellent FTH, an steam at rehydration, opti tile at uh, inoculation. And if we are talking about more varietal characteristics where you have apples that are richer in tannins, you want a um, more rustic style, Excellence XR is, um, with, is our yeast that will express the varietal characteristic with higher temperature, a no steam, and in this case, we will use OptiFlor, which is a very um, a nutrient that will not bring you too much aromas. So last point of this webinar is gonna be uh, talking about microbial control, which you probably wonder why I put um, ratatouille on this um, picture, but you're gonna understand very fast. So on uh, cider making, cider, uh, the biggest concern is lactic acid bacteria, as uh, cider is very rich in malic acid. Lactic acid bacteria are very happy there and they can produce a lot of, of aromas. Bretanomyces is a concern too, but sometimes Bretanomyces is actually wanted in cider. So why, why lactic acid bacteria are a big concern is because they are responsible of many fault microbial deviation and spoilage in cider. They can produce precursors of volatile phenols, they can produce some lactic, yogurty, cheesy type of aromas, but also wet dogs, dirty socks, biogenic amines, which are more like this pond, stagnant water, algae fish food, but also rotten flesh. And they are responsible of mousiness, which is this aftertaste that you find as soon as you drink the cider, you can find this aftertaste that is tasting like a dead mouse of mouse urine. And that's a, something that makes the cider completely undrinkable, which is very common as well in beer and in wine. So, how do we do this? There is some antimicrobial agent that exist uh, to remove, uh, or I would say, um, manage microbes. So you can use sulfur. Sulfur is gonna inhibit most of the microbes, but also ketosan. Ketosan has a wide spectrum, um, antimicrobial wide spectrum that can help you to eliminate microbes early during the process, even during alcoholic fermentation. Lysozyme is focused on lactic acid bacteria. You can use it also early during the process of um, cider making. DMDC or Velcorin, this is mainly for yeast and this is pre-bottling or pre-canning. And if we talk about uh, so filtration, as Mark told you about, there is some filtration units that can help you to st sterile filter and um, you can use it on juice if you want to conserve the juice, but also on finished cider to conserve it in the bottle, and pasteurization. I want to focus on ketosan since it is a fining agent that is pretty easy to use and has a wider spectrum as antimicrobial. So keto, and it's the newest too. Ketosan is a deacetylation of ketin, so it's a polysaccharide derived from Aspergillus niger, which makes it vegan allergen free. So you can see this polysaccharide here which we do a deacetylation, we put it in low pH, and then we become with a positively charged molecule, which is gonna be attracted to the microbe cell walls, all of them, that are negatively charged. This will induce the death of the cells. So as you can see in the graph he here, Bretanomyces is trapped in the ketosan, settled down, it's gonna alter the cell walls, the bread or other microbes are gonna die there, but then you can rack your cider out of the lees and you are cleaned of microbes. The applications, so first it's a vegan allergen free uh, compound that doesn't stain the wine. You can control malolactic fermentation. You can avoid malolactic fermentation 
You can remove spot age microbes. You can prevent the spot age if you use it early in the process. It does not interact with Saccharomyces. If you talk about prevention, we are in low dosage, two gram per hectoliter, so very low. And if you want to remove a contamination, we are between four and six gram per hectoliter. So that's a very easy to use product. And uh, Lamotabier product is called Killbret, even if you can remove other uh, compounds than Bretanomyces. It's, um, so you will see, you can easily remove contamination or prevent for others. So I'm very happy to uh, develop a little bit more this point in the question answer if you do have question on it. So basically now I would like to thank you very much for your uh, attention. We are gonna um, start we are going to start the question and answer portion now. And uh, thank you very much. You can watch this webinar on our YouTube channel that you find here around the little icon. And then uh, our email address, uh, mine and Mark here, that you can um, email us all the questions you have. Thank you very much.